very good morning to all of you on this uh, beautiful Saturday morning on a, in AIOC 2022. Today we'll be uh, talking about uh, the complications which happen during the surgery. A lot of the ICs concentrate on what we already know from before and then we can plan properly uh, of all the complications. But in this instruction course, we are going to talk about all the different complications that happen when you are doing the surgery and what is the plan B that you have to be ready with uh, to take care of the patient. Right from when you are making an incision and with the best of the surgeons, sometimes the incision can go faulty. How do you rectify it? When you are uh, uh, injecting viscoelastic, when you are doing the rexis, there may be sudden deepening of the anterior chamber, there may be sudden shallowing of the anterior chamber intraoperatively. You may have a posterior capsule tear, you may have a drop, so on and so forth. And we have with us Dr. Arun Chhatrapal, who is a senior consultant and for many years in uh, uh, Ajmer. Uh, I'm very grateful to you for being a part of this IC, sir. Uh, we have with us Dr. Vikram Jain from uh, Udupi. Uh, he is a senior consultant at Prasad Netrale. Thank you, Dr. Vikram Jain, for Thank being you. with us today. Um, we would like to begin our first talk with Dr. Arun Chhatrapal, uh, who will be talking on rectifying faulty leaky incisions and managing iris prolapse. That is one of the basic things that we need to master. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you, Satyajit, uh, for including me in this IC. Uh, what I will be talking about is uh, how to rectify the faulty leaky incisions and in managing the iris prolapse. I'm Dr. Arun Shetrapal. Uh, good FACO incision uh, is not, not only it is critical to the success of cataract surgery, but it also gives you a good access to the cataract and helps to maintain the fluid balance. A uh, good FACO incision should ideally induce minimal astigmatism, seals securely, and not only that, it gives a quick recovery to the patient. So the incision is the very first step in the FACO surgery, and it should be a perfect incision. And in case you're not able to make a perfect incision, I'll be talking about how to uh, deal with that. So uh, faulty, leaky incisions, uh, if it's there intraoperatively, it increases the chances of complications. There's a fluid imbalance. There's a uh, certain amount of fluid is coming in, but more amount of fluid is being uh, is uh, going out of the anterior chamber. So there's a basically fluid imbalance, and this can lead to surge. Once the surge occurs, there are more chances of posterior capsular rupture and endothelial damage. Not only that, postoperatively, if your uh, incision has not sealed properly, you can land up with a shallow AC or even endophthalmitis. The fluid, if the fluid can come out of the anterior chamber, it can go back into the anterior chamber if the uh, incision is not properly sealed. So what are the factors which affect the integrity of a uh, incision? It is the size of the incision, the plane of the incision, whether it is a uniplanar or a biplanar or a triplanar incision, and of course the structure of the incision. So uh, we'll be taking all these one by one. So a size of the incision, our oversized incision will leak. So you need to use the right uh, keratome, the right size keratome for your FACO. If you're using a 2.2 millimeter tip, use a 2.2 millimeter uh, keratome. And if you're using a 2.8 millimeter tip, 
use a 2.6 or 2.8 millimeter keratome. So you need to use the proper uh, keratome. Uh, oversized incision can lead to leakage, iris prolapse, and of course fluid imbalance, as I just told you. The other way should not be there. That there should not be a tight incision. The tight incision can give uh, rise to incision burns and again fluid imbalance. So the fluid amount of fluid going into the eye will be less as is, uh, against the fluid which is being aspirated. So the <coughs> uh, incision site should be appropriate. So uh, just uh, one video. Uh, if you can appreciate that the main incision is very well uh, sealed it is uh, snugly fitting the sleeve of the phaco but look at this uh, side port incision you can see a lot of fluid coming out of the side port incision now this is not uh, desired so what I do is I come out of the side port incision you can see that there's a gush of fluid coming out and you can make a very small side port incision beside your old incision and you can seal your uh, previous incision which was oversized so now if you can appreciate that now there's a less amount of fluid gush out of the side port incision, almost negligible amount of fluid is coming. So if you detect that the early in the surgery that your incision is not proper, it is advisable to switch to another incision or make a, another incision uh, which is uh, more, uh, bet which is better and this time you can make a proper incision. Now if you have a disproportionate size of incision, so this will lead to if you can appreciate there's an iris prolapse uh, I'm doing my IA through the main port incision so the main port incision is 2.2 uh, but there's a slight iris prolapse because this is an oversized incision so if you are having an iris prolapse while doing IA switch over to uh, by manual IA Coming to the plane of the incision, the pl uh, just as I just told you, you, you can have a uniplanar or a biplanar or a triplanar. Triplanar incisions are the best incision. Uh, they are the least uh, leaking incision and uh, snugly, uh, snug incisions which leaks the least. least. So what you do is you make a horizontal uh, incision first and then in this groove, you introduce your keratome, go straight and then dip. You can see the, a dimple there. And once you have this dimple and then you enter the anterior chamber. So this is how you construct your uh, triplanar incision. So uh, coming to the structure of the incision. So once you are introducing your keratome, this keratome should be radially introduce your the tip of the keratome should be pointing towards the center of the pupil and it should straight go in and straight come out and the, if you are not able to prop, uh, enter radially you may land up with a bad incision or a poor form of an incision so if you go obliquely the incision size will be more and it will be difficult to uh, for you to maneuver the your instruments then coming to the size of the incision, a too small a tunnel will leak definitely and this too small a tunnel can also lead to RS prolapse. A good incision will be, it should be, the tunnel should be as much uh, length in length as it is wide. So if you are making a 2.2 millimeter incision, so your tunnel should be approximately 2 millimeter or 1.8 or it can be 2.2 millimeter. Too long a tunnel again can cause a problem. Uh, it can uh, cause uh, the cornea to bend and disrupt in your vision of the anterior chamber. Now, uh, just a few examples. Suppose you have this incision. This is at the end of the surgery. If you, can, I'll just stop it. Sorry. Uh, So here is an incision. You can see that the, this incision is leaking. The moment I put a trepan blue, it is washed away. The sedal stress is positive here. So what you do is you make a incision in the roof of the tunnel, a partial thickness incision with your side port knife. And then you hydrate this incision 
so once you hydrate this incision your main incision becomes watertight so I have hydrated the roof and now you can see that the trap and blue is not flowing away it's there one more uh, example of the same thing here you can see the main port incision is leaking the moment I put the trap and blue it just flows away whereas the side port incision is well sealed the trap and blue stays there you make a partial thickness incision on the roof of the tunnel and then you hydrate this partial thickness tunnel and then there is no leakage from the so this is one way of correcting uh, your uh, leaking incisions similarly I'll just cut it short uh, you can uh, do it for the side port incisions as well you can hydrate the side port incisions as well if they are leaking too much so you hydrate at the roof of the incision and then your incision becomes watertight so you can appreciate there is hardly any flow of the dye. Uh, don't be shy of giving uh, in suture. In case you are having a leaky wound and you are not able to uh, seal it in any way, go ahead and give a suture because better to give a suture than to have a leaking incision the next day and a shallow chamber or uh, RS prolapse the next day. So don't be shy of giving incision. Uh, sorry, don't be shy of giving a suture. Iris prolapse, uh, it usually occurs when there is an increase in the intraocular pressure while the surgery. So th there has to be some pressure difference above the iris and underneath the iris. If the uh, pressure underneath the iris is more than the pressure above the iris, the iris can prolapse even through a good incision. And uh, if you enter the anterior chamber, too posteriorly close to the root of the iris uh, it can lead to iris prolapse and floppy irises usually lead to iris prolapse so basically there is uh, a difference in pressure underneath the iris uh, let me take this so uh, there's a more of a pressure underneath the iris than above the iris and the iris prolapses out so what you basically need to do is you need to the basic principle would be to decrease the pressure under the iris and increase some pressure above the iris to uh, get the iris back to its position so the prevention will basically consist of creating a longer incision avoiding over inflation of the anterior chamber with uh, viscoelastic and removing excess viscoelastic before you proceed for hi your hydro dissection make space for the fluid which is you are going to inject and in cases of floppy iris or iris degeneration use hooks rings if required <coughs> just to show you a video so here the surgeon has completed the phaco and now he is preparing to inject a lens and injecting some viscoelastic into the posterior uh, back into the back and due to the over inflation you can see that there is an iris prolapse so how do you manage this sorry this is a rep repetition uh, so what is the intraoperative management for an iris prolapse uh, if you detect iris prolapse early in your surgery and it is repeatedly coming out you can very well change your incision site you can seal your original incision and move on to another comfortable site you must always resist the urge to reposit the iris once you reposit it again and again uh, the iris becomes more floppy it becomes more uh, the pigment there's more release of the pigment and the chances of iris uh, prolapsing out becomes uh, more uh, what we do is we first gently try to massage the anterior lip of the incision and this usually uh, gets the iris back into its position uh, you can decompress the anterior chamber through the side port or through the main port 
and most of the time the iris goes inside without any uh, manipulation and basically you have to equalize the pressure under and above the iris you need to lower the IOP or the bottle height so here the iris has prolapsed so what I am doing is I will just press onto the lower lip and release some viscoelastic from there so as the viscoelastic is released then I will push some viscoelastic above the iris and the iris is back into its position uh, if the iris prolapse is too much so what you can do is through the side port you can take your uh, iris repositor tap on the side port let some viscoelastic escape out and then through the side port you can pull instead of pushing the iris inside you can pull in the iris to its position Uh, this is another case where the iris prolapse has occurred so here I am pushing the iris inside this is a case where there is an iris degeneration and then I am doing a hydro dissection I haven't decompressed the sac much so the iris comes out again now since there is an iris degeneration you can appreciate that the iris is coming out again and again I'll, because of the time I will just skip on to the So I like to conclude that a well-constructed incision is the best way to prevent leaky wounds. A systematic approach is needed to tackle leaking incision and approach should be individualized. You don't have to go with a fixed mindset that I'll do this and then I'll do this. And uh, there should be minimum handling of the iris and incision size should be appropriate. Thank you very much for your attention. What a beautiful uh, uh, teaching uh, presentation you have made uh, Dr. Arun. Uh, he is one of the most uh, prolific surgeons and I am pretty sure these are some of your very very old uh, videos. Uh, but thank you so much for the amazing presentation. Uh, I just wanted to discuss a few things. Uh, do you see a role of uh, air anywhere in forming the anterior chamber when the wound is leaking or you always want to put the suture in the uh, at the at the leaky wound and uh, you you wouldn't want to put any air or see uh, air has a different surface tension and it sometimes helps in uh, maintaining the anterior chamber but that doesn't treat your uh, leaking wound the wound will still leak of course it can uh, stop uh, the aqueous coming out the air will form a the surface tension over the incision site and there will be no leaking but basically what you need to do is you need to treat your incision yes air can help you to maintain the anterior chamber so uh, generally in these patients who are on medicines for prostrate would you want to make your incision any uh, differently uh, than what you do routinely because there's a probability of uh, higher chances of iris prolapses in, pa in patients who are on medicines for prostates? Patient on Urimax, uh, we usually uh, ask them to stop Urimax seven days before the surgery. And, uh, but the literature says that it doesn't really help even if the patient has been on Urimax for say uh, has stopped Urimax two years back but still you can have a floppy iris and uh, we uh, try and dilate the pupil with atropine in such cases we start atropine 8 to 12 hours before the surgery the incision size uh, we, are sh uh, we make it sure that the incision is uh, perfect it is not too long or too short and we always keep our hooks and uh, rings ready for such people. Thank you. And for, for patients who have had uh, multiple times of iris prolapses during the surgery, would your post-operative uh, management uh, be any different from what you do routinely? Yes, there will be more of a uveitis, more of a pigment dispersion, there are chances of glaucoma. So if we start with uh, more frequent steroids and uh, monitor IOP in such cases. And uh, if required, we put them on anti-glaucoma treatment. But not most of the time, but 
very few cases will develop uh, glaucoma for a short period of time, maybe for a week or 10 days. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you so much. We'll move on to the next uh, speaker, Dr. Vikram Jain, uh, who is a very prolific surgeon from Udupi. And uh, right now they have opened a new branch in Mangalore, a uh, beautiful coastal city in Karnataka. Uh, so he's a senior consultant at uh, Prasad Netrale. And Dr. Vikram Jain will be talking to us about a runaway rexis. What next? Uh, Dr. Vikram Jain, please. Thank you, Dr. Sina. Thanks for including me in your nice IC. So let's move on to my topic. What, how do you manage a runaway rexis? An ideal rexis, we know that it's a continuous curvilinear capsular rexis. But definition wise, if you look at rexis, it merely means rupture of an organ. So this would be an ideal rexis, but we don't want this happening. The word continuous is important for us. Continuous curvilinear capsular rexis is what we all want. This would be an ideal rexis. Of course, this is a femtorexis. Not all of us have access to this. Uh, what uh, we'll be discussing is our manual CCC that will be done either with the cystitome or with the forcep. Uh, we should remember that FACO came much before rexis. Rexis was uh, developed much later. Before that, everyone used to do FACO with the can opener uh, capsulotomy. But then can opener no, capsulotomy no, has no, got a lot of Very disadvantages. Good. This was realized over time and therefore it evolved into a uh, CCC, the continuous curvilinear capsular axis. So the axis can run away at any point of time. Here at the superior edge it's running away. This video is not very clear. So basically here what is being done is it's the shear that was given is being pulled back. You pull towards the center, convert the shear into a tear and again go on to complete a rexis. This is one of the easiest ways to do it if it has not run off too far into the periphery. But this is a little uncontrolled maneuver. Sometimes when you try to pull it back, what happens is that the rexis goes on into the zonules itself. And once it goes very near to the equator, it is literally impossible to then get it back by uh, just pulling it towards the center or any other maneuver. In such instances, we are uh, forced to then use a scissor to give a small cut and then try to rescue the rexis. So here we are using a vanas through the main incision. The runaway part is right there, uh, sub-incisional. So you can give a cut and on the central side then convert that and go ahead with your surgery after that implant an IOL in the bag. A video with a mature cataract for better contrast here. Again there is a runaway happening there. Unable to pull it to the center. Getting the vanas to give the cut. The inner fold is then pulled over and the rexis is then completed. There will be some dehiscence there. You see that there. Make sure you implant your IOL with the haptics not in the area of the runoff so that you are not putting any stress there. Perpendicular to it, you can implant your IOL. If it is not sub-incisional, then access to that area might be difficult. This is an old video wherein an, uh, a keratome was used to enter so that the vanas had access to that area and then you go on to continue it. Of course, now we have our micro uh, scissors and micro forceps. Whenever there is a run out, we can always make a small side port through which our micro instruments can come in and I'll forward it too fast. Yeah, here. Through another sm small side port, a small nick is given so that you can go on to continue with that. A more recently described maneuver is the Littles maneuver. Here, you pull the rexis back circumferentially you pull it back so as to initiate a small tear and once that tear is initiated go on to complete that rexis. Again it should not have run off too much in the periphery but this is more controlled in comparing it to pulling the rexis towards the center. Demonstrating it again if that was not visible. Here you have a small runoff that's going to happen there. It was pulled back to center. 
so as to give a continuity there. This may not be ideal, but at least there is full continuity. Patient or the surgeon are having a bad day, it's running off again. So now you see you grab it and pull in the same direction you came from, not towards the center. That initiates a small rip which can be converted. So these are a few examples of how a rexis can be rescued. If you can't make it continuous, there is no harm in giving a nick and then proceeding with the surgery. Even if there's a large runoff, you can go ahead with the phacoemulsification in the presence of a large runoff, a large tear. Be careful and slow down your surgery during that step. In cases uh, where you're suspecting uh, posterior polar and you're expecting a PCR, it may not be advisable to go ahead with the phaco because then you have no support for your IOL other than putting an iris claw. In cases wherein you have planned a multifocal, maybe you might have to change your plan of action. But for all other routine surgeries, even if your continuity is lost, all is not lost, you need not convert from a phaco into an SICS. Earlier we used to do that, the minute a excess runs off and we have to give a cut, we'd be scared about uh, equatorial extension, but that rarely happens in equatorial extension. It happens only when you give too many tugs to it, you go on pulling it as t and you are going to end up pushing the runaway part into the equator, only then you should be uh, a little worried. Give it one or two tries, you can't rescue it, then give a cut with the micro scissors so that you can proceed with the FACO. There need not be uh, conversion from FACO to an SICS. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Vikram, for that uh, beautiful videos. When would... Uh, so, okay, come, come in. I just wanted to discuss that uh, uh, when would a situation arise when you would have an extension, you would have a, a, a runaway rexis, and you would say, now I should not proceed with phaco emulsification. It would be dangerous. Uh, if it's a very hard cataract, uh, and you've seen it going into the periphery to the equator, you know that the surgery is going to be prolonged. There will be instances when chopping the hard cataract, you have to really push it to the periphery. So then there can be an equatorial extension which might go posterior. Uh, uh, regarding a posterior polar cataract, I already mentioned, in such cases, again, uh, you are uh, mentally prepared to have a PCR. Uh, if you don't have a good rexis and you have a uh, a PC, uh, PCR, the dehiscence is pre-existing and there is a defect there, then your next option of putting a sulcus iole is also removed because you don't have anterior uh, su uh, capsular support for the sulcus iole. So in such cases, you might have to think of abandoning a FACO. So Arun, uh, uh, if the extension is uh, right opposite to where you're doing the FACO emulsification, would you still uh, think of going ahead or? It will all depend to the extent the rexis has run away. And uh, my first attempt would be to um, bring down my all my parameters to make it sure that I don't separate my pieces too much and uh, keep all the things very, very low and go ahead with a very gentle FACO. In most of the cases, you can go ahead with uh, a runaway even at the opposite and uh, diagonally opposite to your incision. That's what you wanted to have, right? Yes. Yeah. So and oh, it will okay. again depend on the condition of the zonules as well. In uh, hypermature cataracts uh, where the zonules are slightly weak, there the chances of uh, runaway is slightly more. Uh, runaway towards the equator and beyond the equator to the towards the posterior uh, capsule. But once in, uh, in the immature cataracts where the zonules are good, the chances of it going beyond the equator, going towards the posterior capsule is less. That's what I feel. I have, uh, how, what, what's your opinion, Satyaji? Um, I, I totally agree with uh, what you're saying. Uh, once you have that runaway access, you have to lower your parameters and then go ahead and do the cataract surgery. Uh, I wanted to ask uh, 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 Dr. Vikram, uh, I have promised my patient a uh, trifocal uh, where centering is absolutely necessary and, and I have a, a, a runaway access. I'm a good FACO surgeon and, and I can still manage uh, finishing the case. Uh, I would want to give you both the scenarios, 
that one you, if you are not able to do the FECO and in the scenario in which the runaway excess is there. And then there are issues that if the trifocal is not well centered, then you will get, not get optimal results. So how do you handle those situations? If it's not a toric, it wouldn't matter because you can orient your trifocal in any other uh, axis. But if it is a toric and it demands a particular axis and you have the runaway right there, then it might become an issue. So even if there's a runaway, the rest remaining portion, uh, 180 degrees apart would have good support. Therefore, you can orient your trifocal in that axis and you would still get a good centration. As long as you don't orient the haptics in the area of uh, the runaway part. So if, uh, what I feel is, if my uh, capsular axis opening is covering my IUL almost 70%, 60 to 70% or more than 70%, the chances that my IUL will remain centered. And if it's not able to uh, cover my IUL uh, more than 70 or 80%, the chances are that this IUL may get decentered, so I'll avoid uh, a multifocal or a trifocal in such cases. Again, I guess uh, you would know by the end of the surgery whether it is centered, yes. so you can take a call then too. You can take a call at that time. Okay. Thank you very much, Vikram. We'll move on to the next uh, uh, topic. Uh, Dr. Uh, Subhash Prasad and Dr. Love Kochkave will be sh uh, joining us shortly. Um, Dr. Srinivas Joshi is a senior vitroretinal consultant at uh, one of the biggest centers in South India, M.M. Joshi Eye Hospital in uh, Hubli. They have multiple centers throughout Karnataka and he is doing some, uh, Dr. Srinivas is doing some amazing surgeries uh, e even through his uh, 3D uh, operating uh, uh, systems. And uh, I would like to welcome Dr. Srinivas Joshi who will be talking today on nucleus and IUL drop until where can an anterior segment surgeon manage. He is a posterior segment surgeon, but we have given him, given him an anterior segment topic. Dr. Srinivas, please. Thank you. Thank you, Sina Saab. Uh, I always admire him and the way he talks and uh, the way he manages the things. I think uh, uh, it's a kind of role model thing for the youngsters to emulate from him. Thank you so much. I consider him as my big brother. Thank you, sir, uh, for this and thank you, AIOS. Uh, so coming to... Whenever we have a PC rent, I'm sure you people are managing it so well and pretty well. But I would just like to add a few points to what you people are still doing uh, from the VR perspective, from the vitroretinal point of view, what we request you to do it uh, so that it will be better for us in case of handling. So assessing the situation here becomes very, very important. Identifying location and the extent of the PCR in case there is any constriction, if it doesn't dilate with epinephrine or any other things, then uh, I don't think we should hesitate to use iris hooks or whatever kind of uh, pupil expanders you people prefer to. And uh, assessing the residual cortex and pupillar dilation, avoiding multiple surgeries is, is, the, is one of the most important point. The, uh, another thing I would like to uh, advise is use the disp dispersive viscoelastic. That is very, very important to protect the endothelium because the most effects of the PCR uh, also happens to the retina, but in a later view, but more happens to the cornea and the corneal endothelial damage are more uh, often. So I always advise first to start with a dry vitrectomy before you, uh, you are using the irrigation uh, channel because it prevents the, the vitreous hydration and uh, minimi minimizes the vitreous loss. And uh, it also avoids you know, kind you can avoid uh, trying to increase the size of the PCR. Suddenly you bring in the hydration, suddenly the chamber fluid exchanges and it expands and the PC rent also expands. So always do a dry vitrectomy, but all care should be taken that it should not collapse. Just before it collapses, I think we can start using the hydration. Then uh, while starting the bimanual, I always suggest uh, my fellows and residents to start the hydration. Here you can see I'm keeping it at the tip. Irrigation away from the area of PCR is very, very important. And also we should try to try to find a balance between the AC collapse versus the vitreous hydration. That is another important point. Avoid iris injury and uh, uh, as much as possible, we should definitely try to preserve the rexus. Then comes the important point is the cortex aspiration. So the toggling between the cutting and the suction and the suction alone, that has to be managed. So I always suggest my fellows and the, the residents 
to keep the blade, to keep the cutter in the side, not at the down, not at the up, on the side, so that whatever vitreous is there, vitreous comes to you. And uh, by this, we can avoid the pulling on the vitreous. After doing a good vitrectomy, that is when we have to go ahead and do the, the cortex aspiration management and also uh, try to avoid the pull on the capsule and the zonules. So in case of doubt, uh, don't hesitate to use IVTA because that is very, very important. Some vitreous strands keep uh, you know, sticking at the, the wound or wherever and uh, next day morning, oh my God, such a nice surgery, but I still see a pupillary peaking. So that's the most common finding, the most common thing which we always come across. So uh, please do not hesitate to use, but please use the diluted. I have seen few cases being referred to us because that went into the vitreous and the IVTA concentration was very high in that patient. So again, I had to go and do vitrectomy and wash out that IVTA, whatever had sunken down into the vitreous cavity. So all care should be taken to, it is just like a stain. The IVTA is used just like a stain to identify the vitreous. So I don't think very concentrated uh, IVTA, you can uh, just dilute it and use it just to know that whether the vitreous is there in the anterior chamber or not. So this is what I was showing is the triamcinolone assisted uh, and, and again inject it towards the ports. That is where the vitreous is most importantly going to be rather than injecting in the center. Sometimes we see it going directly down because the, these crystals are pretty much heavier and identify the the residual uh, vitreous stands is very, very uh, important. So after uh, uh, you identify it, you can just give a gentle wash. Now you can see here, there is no vitreous left at all. So uh, just you can go ahead and you can be happy that you have done uh, a good vitrectomy. So if you're not sure to have a good support of our IOL, then it is, I always suggest to have a scleral fixated IOL or iris claw, I, I have stopped using AC lenses long back and I don't suggest people to use AC lenses also. So should an IOL be implanted? Avoid if there is a large rent, especially more than six millimeter in diameter, uh, the chances of dislocation is high. And these are the uh, uh, points I'm speaking when you have a cortex or the nucleus drop. After having a cortex or the nucleus drop, should we implant the IOL is the most important question to be thought of. So the choice of IOL, you all know it is uh, definitely the three piece. Uh, putting the IOL sometimes uh, shakily, what happens is we have seen that it kinds of obstructs us to do a complete uh, vitrectomy, especially when we are doing a uh, PVD induction. So uh, if possible, uh, try to avoid it. And uh, if, if the capsular support is really good, a small capsular dropping, then I advise to straight away go put a IOL, no need to bother at all, and then send it to vitreoretinal surgeons, let them manage about that cortex piece. I'll come to that little later. Then IOL getting dislodged during, while putting the ports, or, uh, or uh, while inserting the infusion. Sometimes if it is not placed very well, we have seen that the haptic coming up and not getting good support. So. Uh, with time, the capsule becomes more and more defined and stiffer. In fact, you people, uh, I, I suggest the anti-segment surgeons at least to defer for some time if you don't have, because as we all know, as in, in, in around 10 to 15 days, the capsule becomes more and more stiffer. That is the capsular femosis, what we call. Secondary IO implantation is always predictable and safe. So uh, management approach, small amounts of retained cortex often can be managed. Now, small means how small? is the question which always comes to our thought. The patient should be always placed on the anti-inflammatory drop, should be followed up closely. Retention of larger fragment of cortical or nucleus matter may lead to vitritis, uveitis, glaucoma, macular edema, and definitely the vitroretinal complications. So I'll be just showing how we do it in the VR perspective once you have a nucleus drop like this. Some people I have seen trying to do an impaling technique. I uh, definitely suggest to avoid uh, doing such techniques and it is better managed by the vitreoretinal surgeon. Here you can see here, it's not just removing the vitreous, it's also you need to do a complete vitrectomy with PVD induction. 
that is very very important otherwise there are chances that he might have a secondary macular edema a peritoneal membrane and various other complications are bound to happen so a good pvd induction whenever you enter inside the vitreous cavity a good pvd induction is very very important so after doing that then we what we do is we put a pfcl try to protect the macula or the fovea from the chattering uh, this thing and since uh, we have a 20 this is a 25 gauge surgery so this is the 23 gauge entry of this uh, fragmentome so step one vacuum step two cut so just put the step one so that it comes to the middle of the vitreous and it is the safest so how you people do phaco in the anterior segment we just do the phaco in the posterior segment so with the help of the light pipe i try to use it and cut it because any fragment this was a pretty hard nucleus as you can see here uh, cutting it into multiple pieces is always important so here i uh, you can see here i'm just trying to bring it back again and with the help of the light pipe I try to chop it as much as possible though we don't get very good support because it's a big cavity in the vitreous but uh, having a good suction and uh, a good cutting action uh, by this uh, uh, fragmentome will definitely help us eat any kind of nucleus as much as possible. Now you can see I'm just trying to make very very small 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 pieces and then try to eat it up and by this way we can get away and uh, do a, a complete uh, vitrectomy with nucleus. So uh, last uh, few slides, uh, in case, I, I'm sure that th this is the, uh, I would like to suggest, there are various options of scleral fixated IOL not, uh, 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 techniques now available. You can do a modified Yamane technique, you can do, uh, this is I'm just trying to show, one of the simplest techniques is the uh, Canabrava technique uh, described by Sergio Canabrava, the surgeon. So here what we do is use this phyoproline and um, I suggest you people have a uh, bovi heat cautery. So just uh, put that proline suture and bring it out. Similar way, try to do it on the other end. I am using this thin board needle of the 30 gauge and then so that the slippage will not be there. So as you bring it out, I just pass it on to the eyelet of the scleral fixated IOL. And now you can see here, I'm just trying to use to make a flange with a bovi heat cautery. And once you make a flange, uh, just try to pull it and see because it should not slip away from the uh, eyelet and then once it is confirmed from both the sides just insert it inside pull it on both the ends you will have a very good centration and then just try to cut it and uh, optimally uh, to what extent you can have the centration just try to heat it now you can see a very well placed lens although it has a little bit of learning curve uh, I'm definitely sure that um, uh, if, if, if I am able to do this then you all will be able to do it much better than me being anterior segment surgeons and I hope uh, we'll do it. Statutory warning, uh, we have put it up in our uh, department, uh, uh, courtesy Dr. A.S. Gurprasad sir, he has, is very particular about it. He says, do not implant an IOL if a PC rent by more than 3 mm occurs. So this is uh, the warning they have put it, I just copied it from our uh, department. So I'll not go into the much detail but last one point. So how much size of these cortex can be really observed is, is what has to be answered. So these are various studies. The presence of the retained lens fragments within the anterior chamber or vitreous cavity always induces an autoimmune reaction to the lens proteins, right? So varying on the size of the lens material, the duration of the exposure and the individual uh, uh, immune response, especially to the cortex or the nucleus. So the exact mechanism of retained lens fragment induced immune response is still incompletely understood, but it is believed to be a T cell mediated hi delayed hypersensitivity reaction. So what the, this majority of the studies suggest that if it's a cortical piece of less than one third, then they can be usually observed. But if it is of any nuclear fragment, it has to be removed. So we cannot keep on observing any nucleus fragment. Cortical matter of less than one third can definitely be observed. More than that, I don't think it's advisable, but you can still, so the most important uh, thing here is the follow-ups. Looking for the pressure, looking for the anti-segment reaction, looking for the vitritis, looking for the glaucoma. So if things are going silent and you see that the cortex matter, matter is doing, getting absorbed. Sometimes we see in a long way, the patient is having intermediate uveitis. We do not know why the patient, we did whole, ran the whole run of tests on him, 
including ANA profile, everything. We didn't know. Then later on, we got to know uh, that uh, he bought that uh, piece of paper somewhere where the PC rent and the small cortical drop, nucleus drop was mentioned. And that was inducing vitritis for him in a long, long, long years. So it's always better to clear it off at that time itself and send it to the vitreoretinal surgeons. They'll do a proper vitrectomy and I'm sure that they'll, we'll be able to give a good care to the patient. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Sinha Sab and all the rest coordinators. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Srinivas Joshi, for that beautiful presentation. Uh, we would like to welcome questions from the audience. If you have any, you would like to ask Dr. Srinivas. No, this is a, okay. So the sutures, what here I'm using is the phyoproline. It's a thick suture where we try to flange it and then we tuck it back into the intrascleral area. We tuck it back. So the, the, the what other sutures we use is uh, we always make a flap and then we take a bite. Or in this technique also, you can make a flap and inside the flap you can raise the flange and close the flap. So it'll be more uh, better in that way. Otherwise, if you see, I'm using the track, yes, 30 gauge tunnel, I'm using the track like this. So you can push it back into the track. And it's not the straight entry into the entry, uh, into the posterior chamber, posterior segment. It is, a uh, uh, yes, it's small tunnel and then you dip it, dip your needle inside. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Srinivas. I would now like to welcome Dr. Subhash Prasad. Uh, who will be speaking on sudden shallowing of anterior chamber during phaco emulsification and he will be also speaking on sudden deepening of anterior chamber uh, which is one of some of the dreaded complications that we can have uh, during cataract surgery. Good morning everyone and thanks Dr. Satyajit for including my talk in your IC. The one which was supposed to be presented by Dr. Harsul could not be so he asked me to present in the morning, so there will be some bit of, little bit of uh, here and there, so please bear with me. So we all know that cataract surgery uh, is almost nowadays very safe surgery because of the advancement in the technology and uh, the machines. But sometimes we end up with a lot of problems and one of the problems which we, we encounter in our, uh, very rarely, but we encounter in our practice is uh, you can say that uh, extreme shallowing of the AC during the phaco emulsification or you can say hard eye. It's not Uh, this is small video clip. This was taken long, long back when I was using Infinity Machine. This was a very hard cataract of grade 4 or can say more than that, a very hard brown cataract. While I was sta I started doing FECO, suddenly I could find that the AC was getting little shallow and was uh, I was having little difficulty and doing all the maneuver. So I thought I would stop and put some viscoelastic uh, sodium hydrate kind of thing and then we'll uh, redo the emulsification of the nucleus. And so I did, I had, uh, removed the side, uh, this chopper. And as soon as I came out, I found that the iris was coming through the main wound and even through the side port. So uh, because of my ignorance, I just went on putting more viscoelastic. I thought that it will push the uh, thing, everything behind and the chamber will become very, uh, will be very amenable to surgery. But to my surprise, it was not going and it, the chamber was not forming. So this reminded me of one of the condition which was described by law OC, way back in 2014, he observed that during the cortical aspiration, he suddenly noticed shallowing of the anterior chamber with rise in intraocular pressure with firm globe and there was iris prolapse in each case. So he termed this case acute intraoperative rock hard, rock hard eye syndrome. So uh, 
So generally, the cello eye, or you can say extreme cello eye in the eye, may not be because of that only, but there can be some other causes like uh, mild cellowing can be due to tight speculum, retrovalvular hemorrhage, periorbital hemorrhage, subconjunctival hemorrhage, even sometimes if, if it is very massive. But uh, um, if it is of extreme degree, then most likely it is because of the fluid deviation or misdirection syndrome or supracoroidal hemorrhage during the FECO procedure. So what is that, this fluid uh, misdirection syndrome? Uh, there is diversion of aqueous or balanced salt solution behind the zonulo capsular diaphragm into the vitreous and uh, this creates high pressure in the posterior segment which causes pupillary block and angle closure uh, as the lens and iris are shifted forward and this leads to rising intraocular pressure and since it acts like a valve so whatever fluid goes it goes behind it's not coming entirely so the chamber gets uh, becomes shallow and shallow and, uh, and further creates more problem. So the fluid misdirection can occur in various stages of the phaco surgery like in hydro dissection. If you inject the VSS through the zonus in the vitreous, instead of lifting the enteric capsule, if you push the uh, lot amount of uh, fluid in the through the zonus, it can go into the vitreous, particularly if there is zonal dehiscence. If there is VSS trapped behind the, behind the nucleus during the hydro dissection, it can also lead to the hard eye. And if there is PCR with the entrapment in the vitreous, that can also lead to sometimes nucleotomy. Uh, if there is forcible direction of the fluid posteriorly due to and if there is cohesive OBD which is not allowing the fluid to come into the anterior chamber that can also lead to that and sometimes in cortical aspiration. So what are the management? So avoid, first thing is that avoid injecting further fluid, uh, assess the situation, lower the bottle height and pinpoint the possible etiologies and quickly try to manage because this is going to lead into further problem. If there is tight speculum, you remove the speculum or you can just start uh, um, intravenous mannitol. And if you proceed without doing all these, then you can land up in multiple problem like risking the posterior capsule, injuring the lens and endothelial injuries. So uh, uh, if it is, uh, if it is so severe that you are not able to manage that, it's better to abort the procedure and let the eye settle for one or two days, then, then, then you can go ahead with the subsequent day and reduce the vitreous pressure. That can be either done by intravenous manitol or the procedure which is I am going to tell you. Uh, but you have to rule out whether the patient has developed supracoroidal hemorrhage or not. But supracoroidal hemorrhage uh, occurs very fast and the patient will complain of severe pain and there are some predisposing factors like very old age patients with hypertension and particularly very hard brown cataract. And to rule out that you have to do indirect ophthalmoscopy in, on the table and it is not possible better to postpone the patient and do V-scan ultrasound. And if, if you uh, suspect uh, subconjunct uh, supracoroidal hemorrhage, it's better not to do anything and let the supracoroidal hemorrhage subside or you can just drain it also later on. Uh, once the supracoroidal hemorrhage has been excluded, you, you should do maneuver to equalize the pressure between the anterior and posterior chamber and for that you have to aspirate the collected fluid which was actu actually suggested by uh, the previous, uh, the, the inventor actually of these conditions or you do a pass plana automated entry vitrectomy which is the most desirable thing. So pass plana vitrectomy, we all know how it is done uh, just now. Uh, Sir has told you how you do entry vitrectomy also. So you take uh, either 23, 25 or 27, whichever gauze uh, vitrectomy cutter is available with you. Almost all FACO machine have that. So you go 3.5 millimeter or 5, 4 millimeter behind the limbus and just go behind the, uh, towards the point it towards the center of the globe. If you can't see the tip of the uh, vitrectomy cutter probe, then it's better to mark 10 millimeter from the tip so that you don't go that much uh, th that much into the vitreous chamber that it can injure the retina. So 10 millimeter line is very safe uh, distance. And you just press once or twice. There's no need to do complete or um, more vitrectomy. Just press once or twice and just two, 0 0.2 cc of the uh, vitreous volume. It, it, if it is taken out, it will solve the problem. And at the same time, do the gentle palpation of the globe to ver verify that the uh, globe has been softened adequately and then is inject the viscoelastic through the paracentesis to depend, uh, depend the anterior chamber. So this was, uh, this was exactly done here, but at that time I didn't have that uh, small sized probe. So I used actually the 20 gauge uh, vitrectomy cutter, but that served the purpose. Here uh, I am just going uh, behind and uh, taking just small amount of interest and then uh, I was ab able to form the chamber and the subsequently the FACO went very well without any problem like any routine case and I was able to implant the lens and you can see the red glow later on also here. So everything was uh, as we get in the normal FACO cases.
So multiple lens was implanted as it was uh, suggested by the patient. Uh, this is the case where I encountered this problem during the irrigation aspiration. See, this was mature ca ca intermittent cataract and everything was fine. When, while I was injecting the lens under the uh, irrigation, the hydro implantation, it did not go into the uh, bag and started just uh, moving in the entire chamber. And I could see that it was the chamber was extremely, extremely shallow and was not able to uh, place the lens in the bag. So, and it was a single piece, so I, I would not have let it remain in the sulcus also. So, I, I thought it's uh, always to place it in the bag, but the bag was not allowing me because there was severe pressure from behind. So, I went ahead and did the same thing and uh, I just removed a small bit of vitreous and then everything was solved and I was able to place the lens in the bag and subsequently this was 23 gauge vitrectomy cutter and then I am doing the IA. Another case, another case here, uh, while doing the cortical aspiration, you can see that the iris was coming little bit, I thought that uh, there is probably the intraocular pressure is little bit high or uh, uh, it was being done with the infinity machine, so I thought the uh, bottle height was little more, but uh, to my surprise, despite forming with the viscoelastic, the iris kept on coming from the two sides. You can see here, this is just like, uh, and the globe was very tight, very hard. So again, I went ahead and then uh, removed a small bit of vitreous and this solved the problem. So this is very uh, useful technique of uh, just removing or uh, just uh, uh, decreasing the intraocular pressure, which is very high during intraoperatively uh, when manitol any other things are not going to work. So just to summarize, hard eye is very challenging situation on some of the cases. Timely intervention can prevent, can prevent further complications and one has to rule out supracoroidal hemorrhage before resorting to pass plana vitreous step, which is very safe and uh, very effective in such situations. So thank you very much. Thank you so much for that uh, beautiful presentation. Anybody would want to ask a question on this uh, for vitrectomy during surgery? So we'll, we'll we'll just take love first, and yeah, and and then you can okay. present the next. Yeah. Uh. So Dr. Love Coach Gawe uh, was for 10, 15 years in Shankar Netrale as a pediatric consultant, and now he has his own center, Netralium, in Kolkata. Uh, he's a pediatric ophthalmologist of national repute, uh, with presentations internationally and nationally. And he will be talking to us on inadvertent posterior capsule tear, no worries. This is one of our biggest fears and he will tell us how not to worry. Dr. Love Coach Gave, please. Thank you, Dr. Satyajit. And uh, one good thing about you is that uh, you give the topic and uh, we are left to find how to make it. And this, this is, this is the only new presentation I've made in this uh, conference and uh, it was a good learning experience. So just um, uh, w before I start, let's go with uh, through the anatomy of the capsules. As you, as we all know, anterior capsule is thinner, but while I was making it, I didn't realize that posterior capsule is so thin compared to anterior capsule. Anterior capsule being 14 microns, posterior capsule is uh, 2 to 4 microns and at equator it is slightly thicker. Mm. So PC tears, it can be of different types, it can be a pre-existing, in periodic cataracts we frequently uh, encounter it as posterior lenticonus and a traumatic cataract and in adult uh, it is most commonly posterior polar cataract. Spontaneously during hydro procedures, many times if you have a small rexis and then the uh, fluid gets blocked in the bag, then and there is an inherent inherent weakness of the zonules, it just gives way during uh, hydro procedures. And intrasurgical, it can be due to during nucleus management, cortical aspiration, or IOL insertion. Risks, all of us know about this just for completion sake. Uh, uh, corneal edema due to the more manipulation during surgery, high FEMA cystoid macular edema and AC reaction, retinal detachment, decentered IOL. These are the risks when we encounter posterior capsular tear. So identification is very important and this is a good video uh, what you can see here and the mistakes 
that was done here. First mistake, it is quite obvious. It is a hard hypermature cataract, but the excess is quite small. So while manipulating, you can see the first chop has been made, second chop, and when you are moving it with a small rexis, you are creating pressure on the zonules and posterior capsule. And when the third time it was being done, and this is the time probably when it give, gave way. Because after this, what you see here is the nucleus has started behaving abnormally. It is going more towards the tempo medial side. It's a temporal incision. And it's not. it would not rotate. So... I, I had a, a, a understanding that something has gone wrong, but still trying to salvage the situation. As you can see, it's not rotating now after this. It's just going inferiorly. Then I try to center it again. And this time, I uh, what, sh what I should have done earlier before uh, initiating the chop, I tried then the enlarging the rexus margin, but probably it was too late by then. And then again, next sign what you see is the posterior dip of the nucleus. So it is quite obvious that such a whole nucleus with a um, PC defect or zonular dialysis, it cannot be salvaged. But you have to keep trying till it goes. <laughs> and it's gone now. So at this point, you call your VR surgeon. <laughs> Next is during cortical aspiration, mm, better visibility of the tear directly. And this was again a very hypermature cataract. And uh, AC, because of uh, manipulation during surgery, the, there is sudden shallowing of the AC uh, due to the iris coming into the port. And at this point, what you see is the PC rent has occurred. Yeah, it's quite uh, clearly visible there. So this is another situation in which you can have a PC rent during cortical aspiration. And you have to be very careful regarding that. Again, you see this portion giving way. This portion, there is a PC rent. And vitreous loss in the AC. So you have to do a vitrectomy in such cases. Next is probably the highest incidence is during the last nucleus fragment removal. And uh, here, as it is a routine cataract, and this is one of the moments when you lose your concentration. And what you see here is uh, while doing the, and here you see the rent. Here you see the rent. Rent has uh, happened due to the um, FACO tip and the mistake. The, again, the mistake is sudden removal of the FACO tip. It should have been, it should not have been removed suddenly. The first, the viscoelastic should have been pushed, and then the FACO tip should have been removed. So, goals of PCR management: avoid first, most important, what all of us want is we don't want to call the VR surgeon. So, avoid nucleus drop, avoid uh, damage to the corneal endothelium, prevent tear enlargement. Preserve the anterior capsular axis because we want to place the IUL in the sulcus. We don't want a scleral fixated or AC IUL. Remove the remaining cortex, the especially those under the anterior capsular axis margin, which are the last to be removed. Maintain the wound size. We don't want to increase the wound size and a well-centered IUL. If we are able to achieve this, then gen probably the damage is not done. Mm. So. Management strategies, first analyze the extent of PCR. As you could see here, it is this portion. Status of the anterior hyaloid phase, whether the vitreous loss is there or not. Location of the nucleus. Comfort uh, with anterior vitrectomy and, anterior and availability of VR surgeon. Luckily, we have quite a few VR surgeons with us, so that uh, stress is not there. So early response. As you could see, in this case, uh, with the case I had shown, the PC rent here, that, that we are continuing. After that, uh, the AC is formed with uh, viscoelastic. And if vitreous loss is not there, if there is no vitreous in the AC, the remaining portion of the nucleus can be very easily emulsified. And ideally, the, the PC uh, posterior capsular uh, tear uh, should be plugged with 
chondroitin sulfate, the dispersive viscoelastic, then the ch uh, chances of further vitreous loss will not be there and nucleus can be emulsified. So in this case, uh, what you see is in one, one hand I have a visco ca visco cannula with by which I am pushing the viscoelastic and uh, simultaneously emulsifying the remaining portion of the nucleus. And this is especially in the last stages when you have the final fragment or during uh, after the cortical um, during cortical aspiration if you are having vitrectomy tips again pars plana or limbal honestly speaking pars plana would be a better procedure uh, if you have a pc rent because when you are doing it posteriorly you are pulling the vitreous inside and then the enlargement uh, of the pc rent chances of that is minimal but since most of us are not trained to do it and we are not comfortable with that, then we do the limbal route. And ideally, the cut rate should be high, uh, cut rate and high vacuum and uh, go deep into the vitreous cavity so that uh, vitreous loss in the anti further vitreous loss in the anterior chamber is avoided. End point when the posterior capsule falls back and there is no vitreous in the anterior uh, chamber. and uh, Always, as Dr. Srinivas had uh, shown, we can use triamcinolone uh, uh, assisted vitrectomy as well to see whether vitreous is there in the anterior chamber or not. FACO versus uh, ECC, again, whatever works best in your hands, uh, th that it should be selected, but these are some of the tips uh, which we have already discussed. IOL scaffold is another thing what we can try in the uh, uh, last piece. Better uh, if we implant the IOL in the sulcus, keep the nucleus above that, and then the remaining piece can be emulsified. IOL placement tips again, m if it has to be placed in the sulcus, sometimes with a small rent, we can always put a single piece IOL in the bag. But if it has to be placed in the sulcus, it has to be a three piece IOL and uh, clear the vitreous from the anterior chamber and you should be absolutely sure about that before doing the um, IOL implantation. And once uh, the it has been done, then uh, uh, use, uh, I generally use pilocarpin to see whether the pupil is round or not. And a round air bubble also helps us to identify that there is no vitreous in the anterior chamber. Thank you so much. Thank you for that beautiful presentation, Dr. Love. Uh, once you have completed the surgery, you have had a beautiful centrally placed uh, lens even after posterior capsule tear. Do you actually uh, tell the patient that something like this happened? Yes, yes, I, I tell. I generally tell and uh, I, no need to magnify it, but patient should be aware that uh, the PC rent has happened and general my language is that the support of the lens was weak so we have placed a different and many times you have to change the lens. Yes. So if you are changing the lens you have to uh, also uh, inform the patient regarding that. Uh, Dr. Arun. Excellent videos. Just I'd like to add one more thing. Once you are uh, FICO emulsifying the last piece of the lens uh, and you had a PC rent what you can do is you can use an IOL as a I scaffold, scaffold, scaffold yeah. and then you can uh, do the FACO emulsification of the last few pieces that will prevent further uh, loss of uh, nucleus fragments into the vitreous. Just one more. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sometimes uh, while injecting the lens, even the single piece lens, suddenly it can eject out of the cartridge and hit the posterior capsule and cause the rent. In that situation, I've seen some of the surgeons placing it in the sulcus and doing the optic capture. It may work, but it's always better to do the reverse capture of the anterior optic, uh, keeping the haptic in the bag and the taking out the optic and then reverse capturing with the anterior capsule. That is so, without sacrificing the lens, one can use that. Yeah. Anybody has a question, please? First, uh, pre-operatively, you have to identify cases. See, uh, especially if it is a posterior polar cataract, traumatic cataract, posterior lentic onus, if we have identified it pre-operatively, then definitely we'll be more careful and chances of success is much higher. So 
identification is important i would say i don't think so sir no no dr subhash is suggesting you do some puja also pre operatively <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the preoperatively, uh, what uh, our uh, regime in the OT is, we always keep our vitrectomies ready before we start any surgery. So this is one of the preoperative things. Everybody should have their vitrectomy ready before the surgery, so that you don't waste time uh, preparing a vitrectomy. The assistant connecting the vitrectomy, running a test, and then handing it over to you. So always keep your vitrectomies ready. Which brings me to the question, Dr. Love, uh, for the benefit of the audience, what are some of the things you would suggest that you must have in a cataract surgery which you do not routinely need, but you must have it in your OT? We have an emergency um, tray in our OT that has vitrectomy, that has CTR, that has capsular hooks, because most importantly, CTR, many times when you want a CTR, it will not be there. And even after having that tray, many times we don't have it in that tray. <laughs> so. These are some things which should always be available in our OT. Uh, so things like pupil expander, triamcillinone. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you very much. We'll, sorry, yeah, yeah, please, please ma'am. Yeah, in those cases, uh, uh, especially in hypermetropic cataracts with a hard cataract. Hypermetropic hard cataract, manitol will definitely help. Three-piece lenses, three-piece lens, uh, sulcus lenses are mainly three-piece lenses. Though some uh, doctors do advocate single piece, but there is no evidence for that. And reason being, single piece lens are thick, and if it is thick, then it will keep on, with pupil mo uh, um, uh, reaction, it will keep on rubbing against the iris and cause pigment dispersion. Hydrophobic lenses are strict no in sulcus because they are going to rub against the iris and they can cause chaffing. So uh, if you don't have a three-piece lens in your OT, either you can defer the implantation to some other point or uh, hydrophilics can s still be tolerated in the PC, but it is not advisable. Yes, PMMA is again a three-piece. PMMA, yeah. That's again the best. PMMA is a good. Thank you very much, Dr. Love. We'll be moving on to the next topic of sudden deepening of anterior chamber during phacoemulsification, on which uh, Dr. Subhash Prasad will enlighten us. Dr. Subhash Prasad is a senior consultant in Patna in Dividrishti uh, Eye Center. Thank you, Dr. Sadhijit again. So uh, regarding that question, which cases can have PCR? I think all cases should be are potential to have PCR. So it all depends on the situations. So sab mein to taiyari karke rakhni hi hai apni. So coming from uh, sudden uh, sallowing of the chamber to sudden deepening. This is again one of the situations which is not so infrequent nowadays. Uh, the advancement in uh, FACO machines has made the surgery quite predictable nowadays and uh, we are very happy with the newer machines where we can deal any type of cataract. But still there are some situations where you can land up with the problem or you can have some difficulty during the surgery. So, oh, it's not coming, it's not coming. So despite having very good machines, we can sometimes have this problem of excessively deep anterior chamber during the cataract surgery, which makes the surgery really very challenging. 
because it's difficult, very difficult to reach the surface of the cataract without severely tilting the phaco and doing that you can severely tilt the wound and there will be distortion of the cornea, so visibility will be very poor uh, or can be compromised. And it may cause sudden, dis uh, actually significant discomfort to the patients when the patient is being operated under topical anesthesia. If the, it, if, if the chamber suddenly depends, then patient may have pain. So this is a small clip of a patient with very high myopia. You can see it's not moving. This video is not opening. Audio visual. This was loaded yesterday there. So the moment I entered the into the anterior chamber uh, with my FACO handpiece and, st and started the fluid on, you can see just observe the how the chamber depends so uh, deeply that uh, it is actually difficult for me to place the FACO probe in the center or do any kind of sculpting or any manu maneuver. It is almost 75 degree of uh, uh, axis uh, at which the FACO probe is being actually held. So it's very really, really very difficult to do FACO in such situation. What could be the causes? The most important is the high myopia, post vitrectomized eye, or if you, you have kept the infusion pressure very high, if you have kept the bottle height very uh, high in uh, machines with the gravity fed system, or if you have overfilled the chamber with the retentive OBD like Helon, where there is a approximation of the iris on the, on the anterior lens capsule, which is actually not allowing the iris to just get separated from the lens capsule, that can also lead to the excessive deepening or there is excessive softening of the globe or if posterior capsule chamber uh, rupture happens during the surgery. So it was Jobberman who first described uh, anterior chamber deepening with the dilation of the pupil and bowing of the peripheral iris, which was sub subsequently named as lens iris di diaphragm retropulsion uh, syndrome by Will Brandt. So what is that? Uh, it is actually reverse pupillary block. Once phaco tip is introduced into the highly myopic eye and the inflow is, in act is activated, the anterior chamber depends and the lens iris diaphragm actually is pushed posteriorly or downward. Iris becomes concave and there is 360 degree of aerodocapsular contact and which actually leads to the dilatation of the pupil due to the uh, pressure of the water column. And uh, how to come out of this situation? You have to decrease the bottle height and reduce the pressure in the anterior chamber. A side port instrument is introduced through the side port as uh, such like iris repositor. You can use the Sinsky hook also. And it is placed under the iris to lift it gently. This is called Sioni maneuvers, which breaks the pupillary block and equalizes the pressure between the anterior and posterior chamber. And at AC it then resumes a normal depth and you are able to do the FACO as the lens comes into the normal positions. This is the small video clip of high myopia. You can see here, uh, the moment I went inside and started the fluid on, you can see the pupil dilates, uh, the chamber becomes so deep and pupil dilates because there's a reverse pupillary block. You are able to see even the journals in the periphery. So I am uh, uh, taking the iris repositor just below the iris uh, and then it actually aborted the pupillary block and now I am able to do the surgery in this patient. This patient was high myopia, had high myopia. So uh, in high myopia, uh, you are always, uh, you always actually be observant that uh, uh, it should not have uh, very large fluctuation of the anterior chamber. So I am injecting the viscoelastic before taking out the irrigation. That is very important in these cases. This is plus four diopter of uh, the single pieces lenses has also started coming into the market less than five diopter, which was not earlier. So this is from Optic Plus. So I have implanted in this patient and uh, uh, this is another case. It is post vitrectomy eye. You can see the port uh, scar here and uh, uh, this side also. And uh, um, the moment I went uh, into the anterior chamber again, the same thing happens. So here again, I am going to use the iris spatula or you can use any other instrument just to uh, reverse this pupillary block and then you can go ahead with the phaco emulsification. Uh, 
another one which has already been shown by so many previous speakers this is a case of very hard cutter the two halves were made but uh, while i was trying to do the third uh, the chopping for the third piece uh, suddenly there was a deepening of the anterior chamber anterior chamber and that was uh, that gave me a clue that uh, probably posterior capsule dent has occurred so you can see you can observe here suddenly the chamber will deepen so this is one of the signs uh, of posterior capsule rupture another case uh, everything was going so smooth without any problem but uh, uh, while i was removing the last quadrant suddenly there was posterior capsule rent and the this is actually uh, the posterior capsule rent actually produces the sudden deepening of the anterior chamber with pupillary snap sign with increase in glow you can see you can you will able able to see the increase in the glow here and the pupillary snap also so this can happen uh, if there is uh, posterior capsule rent you can have sudden deepening of the anterior chamber so here without uh, before taking out the uh, hand piece you have to inject viscoelastic through the side port so that there is no further extension of the posterior capsule rent which is very so uh, which is so so essential in these cases as highlighted by dr love and then again uh, then i went ahead with uh, doing the anterior vitrectomy i won't go into that detail this has already been covered by previous speakers so how to prevent uh, when the uh, phaco needle is introduced it is always better to introduce with the irrigation off mode and once you are there then you put it on on before it is switched on you you introduce a second instrument through the side port under the iris to lift it slightly this is this has been suggested by richard packard and every time whenever you enter the anterior chamber it has to be repeated until unless you have removed the uh, uh, actually nucleus uh, the newer machines the active fluid is, is really very beneficial in these situations you can actually monitor the intraocular pressure you can keep the machines intraocular pressure very low so that there is no deepening of the entry chamber suddenly and also you can modulate with the rise time rise time is the time taken for the uh, pressure to rise uh, in the given uh, machine where you can modulate it and you can let it uh, rise slowly uh, this is one video clip we using the active fluidic system here earlier surgery was being done 55 now i am doing under tw tw just 20 mm or 24 mm mercury i have introduced the faculty you have hardly seen any fluctuation of the anterior chamber in this patient if this is patient of high myopia high myopia with cataract and uh, while chopping and removing the quadrant pieces there is no undue fluctuation of the anterior chamber just like in any normal cataract patient so even with the intraocular pressure of 22 uh, I am able to do the FECO without any problem and with all ease and all comfort. So that is very important uh, uh, facility now available with uh, advanced machine where you can handle all such, such type of patient. Here again in the myopia, you would actually you would not need, this is minus 10 diopter of lens. You can see that the patient was quite uh, highly myopic patient. So even in this patient, I was able to do surgery without causing undue deepening of the entry chambers. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, one thing what uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Arun was saying that he uses the IUL scaffold when there is a PC tear. Uh, would there be a chance that when you're putting a f the FACO probe once again, that the scaffold that you have put as an IUL may also go down? Because I use this scaffold when I have an IUL crack. So I put a IUL first and then remove the uh, IUL which has uh, broken. Actually, one has to try it, it put in the sulcus. And even you can just keep the one uh, leading, uh, the trailing haptic outside the wound also. That can also, or even you, you can place it iris. over the iris. The two haptics lying on the iris, that is required. You never try to go blindly because if there is nucleus piece in the anterior chamber, you are not able to see the uh, sulcus properly. So it's better to put in the over the iris, below the lens and use uh, the use this hydro uh, contracting surface to protect the endothelium and to create some space between the nucleus and the iris or iris or uh, entry capsule that actually guides thank you so much thank you anybody would have a question so we are exactly at 10 25 and that is the time uh, we were uh, allotted uh, we would like to really thank all the speakers dr arun chatrapal from ajmer Dr. Vikram Jain from uh, Udupi, Dr. Subhash Prasad from Patna, and Dr. Love Kochaway from Kolkata for their uh, enlightening us. Thank you so much to all the participants who came here this morning on a Saturday morning for being with us. Thank you so much.